Vanessa Jones, welcome to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely, and thanks for reaching out. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to let folks know that most of the time, our guests on the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast are directly connected to Rocky Mountain fiction writers and or are members of uh, RMFW, or they're going to give a presentation, or they're going to attend the conference. There's some sort of more... Um, connection to the people we interview on the podcast. I don't know where that rule came from. I'm the only one who's ever hosted this podcast, um, at least most of them. But um, I really thought it was important to talk to you uh, for two reasons. One is you've got a brand new book out that's been out for a little while anyway. Um, but I think your role in the reading and writing community is really significant. For those who don't know, you are the uh, organizer slash host of Readers Take Denver, which is an enormous event. So yes. we want to get into that um, down the road. And I think a lot of our RMFW members will be really interested in hearing about that event and how you dreamed it up and you know how much work it must take to pull it all together. Yes. So uh, that's a long preamble to say, again, welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Well, I'm excited to be here and I'm always um, excited to talk to um, other writers and to do anything I can do to help with anybody's journey. Um, you know, I, I've always said you have to keep chasing that dream and you have to have a lot of rejection to get to <laughs> um, success. And I will also always say that if you haven't been rejected, then you're not on your journey yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, is that true? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so let's 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 cover the background a little bit, and then let's get into the new book and find out more about that, and then we'll get to readers take Denver. Okay. So give give us that background. Um, this is the first novel under the name L. R. Jones, but yes. you have been extremely widely and well published under Lisa Renee Jones, correct? Correct, correct. Um, yeah, I started out publishing straight romance, and I'm still publishing romance. I love romance. Um, and um, romance is probably the genre that's seen the most shift with indie publishing and that kind of thing. Uh, but I started out, I wrote like 20 category romances. Um, so before my career ever started, I did that. And um, back in the day, category was a little different than it is now. I, I feel like indie romance is almost like category romance now. I mean, everybody can't wait for the next batch of books to come come out because there was no indie. So, you know, a lot of people just read those um, category romances. And I learned so much writing those because I had some really good editors who actually gave me great advice that I use to this day with writing a thriller. You'd think that wouldn't be the case, but it is because I was still trying to write thrillers even then. It would be like, Lisa, stop trying to kill people off. This is category romance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got a lot of good advice from those editors that cross over to other um, imprints as well. Yeah. So I did that. And then um, uh, when Indie hit, I had a really hard time getting out of category. You get um, kind of typecast, so to speak. Um, yeah. And so um, Indie hit and I was one of the first ones who hit really big in Indie. And then I had a series that went to auction it got, um, with the publishers then it went to auction in Hollywood and it just it really made my life, you know, my career and, you know, made sure that I'd be writing the rest of my life. Um, but, you know, with all things, I think you can get bored, you know, you want to keep stretching your mind. And um, I'd always written um, a thriller aspect to all my books. So here I am now writing thrillers, but it's very confusing to people who know that I write, you know, romantic thrillers to know wh which books have no romance in which do. So therefore the name change. Yeah. yeah. Can you give us a few ideas of the titles that were category romances that did really well. And then tell us a little bit about the series that got auctioned. Oh, well, category, you know, those are so old and so gone. And, you know, okay. category was different back then. Yeah. But like I have, um, so there's a series that went to auction and did so well is called the Inside Out series. And it has literally been optioned in Hollywood for 10 years. Uh, if I were you as the first book. Um, and um, then the series, the second series I had that really took off was called the Amy Benson series. And it's actually being, it's a TV show at Passion Flicks right now. So I don't know if um, some of your members know Passion Flicks, but season two launches in August. Um, and I'm 
uh, it's been fun. It's been a fun journey. It's not the same as a Hollywood journey, but um, Tosca Musk is the owner of that production company. And she actually, I knew that she was a director um, and producer in Hollywood um, long before she did Passion Flicks because her name had come up in Hollywood as I went through this 10 year <laughs> process, um, which I could speak so much on because I've been through so much in the Hollywood. Um, it, it, I call it my roller coaster ride of champagne and tears because I've literally been to the point where we were going to, you know, cast the next day at Paramount and then had um, somebody leave the next day and it changed everything. Um, but um, I, I've had so many of those stories in Hollywood. Um, and the last time was COVID. We were about to start production and COVID. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to keep going and never give up. Um, and it happens when it's supposed to happen too, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so Amy Benson, um, both are, um, both are thrillers though, but they're, you know, romance as well. So they both have, and that's what I've always written is something with a thriller side to it. Um, so it, it was actually different for me to start writing thrillers without the romantic element because there are different things that drive your story. It can't be the romance driving your story. Um, and I can remember when I first started doing that, it was like, oh God, is this boring? Cause there's no romance. No, it's not boring. You know, so you have to step back and think what's driving the story, um, characters, plot, um, the mystery, but not romance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what prompted the search and tell us a little bit about how you wound up with your new publisher? Um, what, did you did you always have this idea for uh, You Look Beautiful Tonight? Was that something that had been around for a while and something you've been trying to work on? Or was that a more recent idea, what happened? What's funny about this is it was a kind of bizarre way this happened. I sold a different book, the one that's coming out in February called um, The Wedding Party. And um, so my editor was like, um, so what are your ideas for your next books? So I'm like, oh, well, I have some ideas. Let me jot them down. And then right before I sent it over, I had this idea that just popped in my head. And so I scribble it down, give it to my agent. And when my editor saw it, she's like, this book has to be your launch book. You have to write this now. We've got to put everything off. I'm like, wait, what? And I was like, but I have like pre-orders up for like indie books and stuff. And she's like, it doesn't matter. Just talk to them, get them moved, write this now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it was crazy. My All of a sudden I'm rushing. I crunched it and much faster than I would have liked to, but, um, but it was still exciting. And um, so all because an idea that popped in my head last minute became my launch book instead of the next one, which I love the next one. I'm actually really excited about, but I've had a lot of time to get attached to it too, you know. So what was the idea? How did you scribble it down and give it to your agent? What was? Um, an invisible uh, librarian in Nashville who feels invisible. And um, all of a sudden she starts getting notes from somebody, like nobody notices her. And then all of a sudden she's in a coffee shop and somebody leaves her a note, you look beautiful today. And then the notes keep coming and it starts this um, a stalkerish relationship, even though it feels much more genuine to her because somebody's noticing her. And then the next thing you know, this person's calling her and suggesting that she needs to get her life in order. And if she won't do it, he'll do it for her. And that's when it gets dark. But one of the things I like about this story is the same thing I liked about Inside Out that I think made Inside Out so in Hollywood, not just the thriller side of things, but also there's this journey that a person is taking that you can relate to. Um, you know, all of us have felt invisible at some time in our life. And I think that when you're writing, the times that you hit the magic is when it's something that people can relate to. And um, Inside Out, it was a journey that someone was, it, it's a journey that Sarah is taking and she's, you know, suddenly reading a journal from someone that, you know, was found and finding out that this woman has all the same insecurities. And then she has an ominous entry in the journal and she goes and tries to find her and then starts kind of living her life. So, you know, it's these, these, um, these stories that I think connect the most are ones that we can take a personal part of ourselves and, you know, find them in that story. Um, but I also think that's what makes the best bad guys um, is if 
you relate to the people that could be the bad guys and it's hard to guess them because why would you guess that somebody you relate to or who seems like your mother or your neighbor would be a killer? Um, so I think that's true whether you're writing romantic suspense or you're writing straight up thrillers. Um, everybody needs to somehow be relatable and it's very, very, very hard to, to guess if the person seems like somebody that you relate to. I just, I really feel that is true. Yeah. Do you stick uh, with the single point of view with your librarian or do you go back and forth to the antagonist too? I stuck with single point of view and I don't always do that. Um, with the poet, I had the, the killer's point of view in there, which is fun to write. But I also think that sometimes when you dive into the other point of view, it can be easy to give away who that person is. And if you're writing a story where you don't want the readers to be able to guess that, that can be um, you know, exceptionally important you know, that you keep that, that one point of view. Um, but with the poet, um, I mean, oh gosh, so fun. And my husband was very excited with that one because his favorite narrator read the bad guy. And I swear he was listening to the book. He's like, oh, he's so good. He's so good. I'm like, yeah, but what about the book? But he's so good. All he could hear was Scott Brick reading <laughs> the bad guy. He That'd been my whole career. He's like, Scott Brick. I'm like, Scott Brick doesn't read romances. So here we go. He finally got a thriller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what does, did he read this one? And did he listen? No, to, this one, it, uh, <laughs> female. Yeah, female. So yeah, uh, right. Yeah. No, I meant your husband, not the oh, narrator. Oh, oh <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Yes, yes, he did. And um, But my book that comes out in February, he's like obsessed with that book. He swears is my best book ever. And that's always fun. I mean, I got for um, You Look Beautiful Tonight, I got a star review from Publishers Weekly. And I will tell you that I, inside out, hit the New York Times many times, USA Today list many times. Never did I get a star review. So I, I got a little teary eyed when I got it, because I think in our career, it doesn't matter how long we've been writing, there are landmarks um, and things that feel special to us. Um, and that certainly did to me, especially when you're changing genres like that. You know, you're you like doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Would you rather have more sales or the star from Publishers Weekly? Sales. Oh, gosh. I Honestly, sales. Yeah. I mean, give yeah. me, the, you know, sales enough to hit the times over the star any day. Yeah. Yeah. But still, yeah. you know, it's still a nice little thing. You really would like to just have both. <laughs> yeah. 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 So looking back on all the writing you've done, what what is the one thing or two things you wish you knew when you were starting out that you know now? Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, understanding the re that rejection's part of the journey. Also confidence in yourself. Um, in a story I'll tell that I think is a really important story and I do tell this when I speak a lot. Um, so when I, I was category romance and, but I had done, I, then I became the author that was in every anthology with everybody else at all the, all the other publishers, but never a single title deal it was so frustrating to me. So um, I knew a lot of editors. And so when I wrote Inside Out, I already had one of my series hitting the Times and the USA Today list, my indie series, over and over. And so when I wrote Inside Out, I knew it was special. It felt in my gut, this was the best I would ever be. Um, not that, you know, I still think it's probably the best I ever was. It was special to me. And so um, my agent told me at the time that it wasn't going to sell. And I just, I knew better. Um, and she also said at the time, Mindy was still new, you know, that her foreign people wouldn't try and sell it. So I found another agent and I said, look, I just need you to sell foreign rights. I can make plenty of money on this myself in Indy. And um, so she read it and she said, she was like, you know, I'm a fan. I've read your stuff in the past. I'd love to do your foreign. She shows it, you know, she reads it, shows it to the head of her agency. And they were like, this is special. This needs to go to like the big wigs at the publishing houses. Please let us do that. And I, I said, I, I'm not, oh, I, I left a part of the story out. I had already gone to one of the publishers, to an editor, and they made me an offer for $10,000. And I'm like, no, no. And, and I remember the surreal moment when I said, no, I was, I remember where I was. It was in a mall in Colorado Springs. And I said, no, I, I can't accept that. And so when this new agent said, can I shop it? I'm like, well, I'm not gonna accept $10,000. I've been down that path. Um, and then 
ironically, I'm in a mall in Denver a couple weeks later, and she calls and said, we got a six figure offer. And I said, um, uh, okay, take it. And she's like, no, not, not yet. And then it was the next level and the next level. And it went into a major deal, you know, about 500,000. And I, I was stunned, but I think the story here, the for, for, sorry, I can't get it out for writers is that you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to have the courage to go into this believing your worth. And the other thing is coming from a corporate background, I mean, you don't have to feel guilty about making money because the publishers are there to make money. If you are not making them money, you will not be with them. Also, if they barely spent any money on you, they don't have a lot of motivation to put a lot into you because they don't have anything on the line. So oftentimes, and I've seen this a lot of times in the many years, of, I feel very old, but the many years I've been in this business, authors, um, like Kenzie and Hinton had a period where they decided to go down erotic romance and they paid authors like $2,000 and authors signed to give away all their rights, run careers, they made no money, they tie, were tied up forever. And then that was on their print record too, that it didn't sell well. So there's so many layers to this and as to why you have to go into it calculated and knowing your value. And um, so, I mean, believe me, I remember the early stages of being like, just somebody say yes, just somebody say yes. But that can be such a dangerous mentality. And I'm fortunate that I got smart at the right time because I perhaps one moment, you know, had I made, you know, waited another moment and changed my mind, it might have never turned out like it did. Um, uh, and a year earlier, would I have been that confident to do that? I don't know. Um, but it, it takes courage and you just have to have it and believe, believe, believe in yourself. But you also have to do the hard work and know that your work is the caliber it needs to be. I can tell you that there, I have early works that were actually published with big publishers that I have gotten the rights back because I don't even want anybody to read them. I think they're horrible. We all think our work is so great until later when we realize it's much better. So- That is so true. That is so true. And, and it's just amazing how you get a whole new uh, standard for yourself. You acquire a new standard for what is effective writing and effective storytelling over time. It's and I, I agree with you completely. The early drafts, I thought for sure. I mean, I actually had good agents for some early drafts that never sold. And I'm so glad they didn't sell. Yeah. Looking back. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's so funny is when I talk about going to auction, I ended up with gallery and my um, editor was uh, Mickey Nugent, which she's retired now, which well-deserved. But um, so I had been with this publisher that some some people might remember, Elora's Cape, which was one of the first, you know, romance, sexy romance publishers. And they did a deal with Pocket and actually went into print. And um, so when I sold, <laughs> Mickey said, oh, I edited that book for you. And I'm like, oh God, I'm sorry. <laughs> And she went, I loved it, Lisa. I'm like, oh my God, it was horrible, but thank you. I appreciate it, but no, it was horrible. But it was just funny to me because she was, you know, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I hated looking at that. I still hate looking at the old stuff. I really yeah. do. <laughs> so are you in right now, you're going back and forth, thriller to romance? I am, I am. So you got your dream world, right? I do. Yeah, I really enjoy this. Um, it can be tricky because like right now I'm writing um, a series that's really heavy into crime scene um, uh, stuff, the procedural. Um, and then I'm going to turn around and write a romance. And it's such a different mindset. I can find it's tricky to switch and get started again, um, one to the other. Um, but still, it helps not. Uh, I enjoy the challenge, too. And I think um, I can look back at my career and say the books that were the hardest for me to write were the books that I grew as a writer into. Like I, when Inside Out has a spinoff series called Careless Whispers and I wrote Amnesia. Oh my gosh, that is the hardest thing. I warn everybody to write because you can't say this is the best, you know, mac and cheese I ever had, the best sex I ever had, the best yeah. anything because you don't remember. Yeah. So that was so tricky and how to develop a character that doesn't remember the best thing is to has no comparison. That was rough. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I came out of the crime fiction world and a lot of people say 
you know, how can you come up with a new plot in the world of crime fiction and mysteries and, and thrillers? But I would say it's triple the odds of coming up with something fresh in romance. It just, well, and first of all, it just seems, it's just, it's, it's just an incredible genre for how much it sells right now. Yeah. The, the, the sales are just unbelievable when you look at what's, what's moving out there. It's, it, it, it's that the romance is a juggernaut that will never stop. It is. I mean, um, and it goes through different phases. Like, um, yeah. and I'll tell people, you know, like you can see now fantasy is coming back. Fantasy was dead. It was huge, you know, for a while. Um, and romance, you know, historical dead. Now it's back. Um, everything has cycles. And that's true in business and life, too. When I was in business, I used to always say what goes up must come down. And that's so true of look at the 90s, what happened. Um, so, you know, we see in romance these cycles of things that you can decide do you want to write to the market or do you want to write what you love and it's interesting because we have a lot of social influencers involved in the convention because they are now such a part of the world that we live in it doesn't matter your genre they are and um, one of them said to me one of the things that's getting irritating to all of us is everyone writing to the market and therefore not writing good work because it's not something they really want to write um, so I think you have to be careful, you know, about following the trends. That doesn't mean you can't. I mean, when I wrote the Amy Benson series, New Adult was really huge and it sold like hotcakes. And but I also wrote something that had a thriller line to it that I was passionate about. So I found a way to write to the market that worked for me. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to write MC romance. And I, you know, I think there's a lot of readers that absolutely love it, but I think I'd butcher it and do a horrible job. So I'm not going to do it. Also, I love to read historical, but oh my gosh, I'd get it all wrong. And the pressure I would feel about that, I feel that with crime scenes as it is. I think fortunately I have some law enforcement, you know, around me that I can ask. <laughs> but um, so I think, you know, the thing you just have to remember is, you know, um, make sure you're really passionate about what you love because whether you realize it or what you write, whether you realize it or not, it does come through on the page. Also, you know, trends come and go and um, you just have to be careful that it doesn't put a mark on your, you know, your history because, you know, you tried to do something that wasn't the right thing for you to do. Yeah. Also, I mean, I don't want to write about certain things. I just don't. They don't hit that mark. And so I don't. Um, but um, it is hard to come up with things that are unique. That's why you have to focus on character. Characters are what will always be unique and always be special. And um, in reality, romance is to a lot of degree um, character driven. Yeah. Every story is not. A crime fiction is not necessarily character driven. Um, it just depends on the story. Um, and I think that um, that's the thing to remember if you're trying to dive into romance to focus on the characters. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you read a lot of romance just to keep up with what's going on out there? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I actually listen on in audio while I'm um, at my at the gym. I kind of a workout nut. Um, and that allows me to be able to fit it in. But I have to be careful because I write first present and I can start writing in the wrong. I, some people that doesn't bother, but it does me. So I try and pick books that are in the same, you know, method of writing that I choose because that helps me. So sometimes that limits me and I have to wait till I'm at a break to read the others. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, uh, we definitely want to this little segue here. I don't know exactly how to make a smooth segue out of this, but I want to talk to you about uh, Readers Take Denver. And uh, I, I've never attended it. I've only looked online. I've heard people who, I know many authors who've gone and the scale of this thing is hard to describe. <laughs> Just even the number of writers who attended this year, you could make a full-blown, very well-attended conference out of that, let alone all the readers who come. So yeah, we're expecting about 1,700 in 2024. Um, so our launch was in 2023. 1,700, 1,700 writers? People, just people, people. in general. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, so um, the event um, originated because my husband and I had a cat named Julie. Um, she's an oriental short hair. She got cancer. Um, we, um, because she'd taken steroids um, once for a skin infection when she was young, she couldn't get insurance. 
So it was a $30,000 affair for us. Fort Collins um, um, did radiation. It was in her nose. So we were able to get almost four years and they were really special years to us. It's, it's the strangest thing um, but because my husband and I said we would never have animals because you know we were too busy, blah, blah, blah. And then we found this cat that should have been chipped and very expensive and she became our daughter. And um, so a lot of my readers watched her journey online um, and we decided, you know, how can we honor her? And um, for so many writers, their animal is their writing partner. Um, so we decided that we would do this charity uh, um, to help sick animals. But, you know, it's so easy to say we're going to do it and not do it. And then finally, we just said we just have to do it. And what's the best way to make money for the charity but through what we know. We also, I've been in this business a long time. My first published book was in 2007. So I've been around since there were a lot of big writing conventions and they were very old school. You know, you go, you, you publishers talked about um, what their new imprints are, what they're wanting from, you know, writers, um, how to get, you know, published with them, um, marketing, everything from, they, you get the publisher's perspective, you get the editor and the agent perspective in general, um, but you'd also get other writers telling you, you know, the things I've talked about today, you know, how to navigate your career, how to, you know, what, you know, and then basics like writing a synopsis, you know, plotting, you know, how to make a, you know, a heroine that's relatable, how to make, a, you know, the story come together. And, um, but, you know, then also these big conventions have popped up that are all about um, book signings, book signings, book signings. And that's great. And as an author, I love that because you get to meet a lot of new readers. So I wanted to go into this and combine the two. And so that's what we're doing. So the first year was mostly a signing that we did have a lot of great speakers. Like we had a sniper and we had somebody who does um, ethical hacking for the government. We, you know, a lot of people that, you know, can, you know, spur ideas for your stories. Um, but um, we're going to have a lot more of that this year. So we'll have the writer's side of things, which we're having editor agent appointments um, and all of the workshops going on. And then on the other side, there's all kinds of fun things for readers. Panels with the authors and then the authors will sign after the panels a couple big signings, but we even have what we call our rising star signing, which is authors who maybe who've only published one book or who've delved into indie, but they're trying to get with, you know, go further with their career and they can have their first signing. So that's on a separate day. So it's just a big um, event that is meant to be for everybody at every level of their career. Um, and for me, um, I, and then at night, I left out the part where there's parties and fun at night as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, for me, um, I really want this to be something where every year you go, you know, you're going to have something unique and special and exciting happen because I don't want it to become where every year this is exactly what happens. We want unique special things. So our goal is to surprise everybody every year. And so this um, this year will be at the Gaylord um, Aurora. Um, and we signed on for four years with them. So um, wow. color is kind of stuck with us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, the Gaylord, the Gaylord is a big, huge facility. So that sounds like a good match there. It is. Um, when When is it going to be? And what does a author, or a lot of our listeners to this podcast are writers, what what do they, if they want to be involved, if they want to be one of the writers who is featured, how does that work? Um, so um, it's April 18th through April 21st. Next and, year, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we already have the dates for the uh, for the next few years too, though, on our website. Um, and then if you go to our website, there is a form to fill out and we're pretty fast to respond. We are um, getting, so we were saying that we were full on authors, but we finally got some floor plans worked out with the Gaylord and we're able to fit some more authors in. So we do have time, or not time, but um, space now we're excited it just happens to be the perfect timing talking to you that we can get some more authors in um there also i think a really important thing to point out is so many of these writers programs where you go in for the workshops to meet agents meet editors um they charge 500 and up our entire event is 300 dollars so you get 
all of the writer side of things and all of the part where you get to connect with readers. Because from my perspective, the time in my career when I was broke <laughs> was the time when I was trying to make it. You know, I mean, even writing category romance was pretty much, you know, less than school teacher pay, which tells you, you know, yeah. even when you sold a lot of books, it was not a lot of money. Um, so I feel like, you know, we're supposed to be helping people become successful and we don't do that by being greedy. Um, but, um, and so last year we were able to donate $13,000 to the charity. Um, this year we feel like we've learned a lot and we'll do a lot more. So, wow. Yeah. You must just feel so satisfied by seeing this come to fruition and pay off in so many ways. I, I do. I'm very, very happy about it and excited. Um, I'll tell you, I owned a multi-state, very large staffing agency for 11 years, and I felt like I was back in that world um, during the event and right in the months leading up to the event. And that experience has been really important for me because um, I had people working at all different job sites and they had to be perfect. And ultimately this is like that because so many different events and everything has to be perfect and everybody has special needs and we want to make all of those things perfect. And I'm such a perfectionist. Um, I didn't sign at the event last year because I was trying to take care of everybody. People put their faith in me, readers and writers, and I felt that I needed to be available to make that happen. So that that's the same way that I'll approach the new event as well. So you really are just there to help run the it's not it's not the Lisa Jones showcase. It is not. It's really about all the other authors. And I'm really careful to make sure that they know that, too, that this is about them, not me. Um, and that's important to me because I want everyone who comes to know that if they're wanting to connect with readers, it's not about, oh, you can connect with readers next to Lisa. No, it's about them. Um, yeah. And we, we have a lot of fun events for the readers too. I mean, I think that that's really special. Um, we are able to bring a lot of joy to those readers who wanna come back and see them. And I, like I have um, T.L. Swan came in from Australia last year. She is such a huge um, uh, animal lover. And so she's coming back this year and we're so happy to have her. She is such a nice person and wildly one of the biggest names in romance right now. And um, so the readers actually getting to connect with her from Australia. One thing we're doing though, is we, we did have oxygen last year. This year, we're gonna have a whole lot more oxygen and we're gonna have IVs because people coming in from um, even other states that are not used to our altitude, they struggle. And, um, but coming from Australia and other countries, those um, people really, struggle. So, um, so we're definitely going to do more of that this year, little things we learn our first year, you know. Okay, the oxygen, I get the IVs for hydration. Yeah, that really makes a difference. So I never was really big on that. But then one day I always felt like I was getting sick. And somebody said, uh, go get an IV. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm desperate. I have a book too, right? I was shocked. They put all kinds of zinc and vitamin C and everything. And I felt so much better 24 hours later. Um, yeah. So the other yeah, drink of water. I'm gonna have a drink of water <laughs> just to celebrate that. Yeah, yeah, and um, it really does um, help the the hydration from the standpoint of when you're like coming from Australia over here, flying in itself does dehydrate you. Um, yeah. So you get that fluid, you get the oxygen, and it really does help you enjoy the event. But also, let's just think about those big, huge crowds. Getting a boost of vitamin C and some zinc and all in you know in you can really help too. That's great. Yeah. It sounds like you've thought of everything, Lisa. I've tried. I've tried. I don't know. I promise you there will be like so many things I'll learn this year too. But the thing about me is I try to really learn, like if it went wrong, it will never go wrong again. Or I don't want you to know it went wrong, um, you know, because we were smooth enough to handle that. I'm fortunate that I have some people that um, are really close to me that I really trust who are involved in the event and they're just as passionate about the event and about animals. I mean, I think when you're really passionate about the cause that also helps helps you be really passionate about taking care of the people who make that cause, you know, happen. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Well, as we wrap up here, we always like to give our guests a chance to promote or suggest um, a writer or a book that you read recently, or maybe something you read 20 years ago that you think everybody should read, whatever it might be. Well, you know, I think appropriately now, since fantasy is coming back so much, 
um, Karen Marie Monning's Fever series. I love that series. Also, one of the things I love about her is she started in romance and wrote really great romance. And Fever is a straight up fantasy series and it's brilliant. And um, if you haven't read it, it's addictive. So terrific. Great. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. Good luck with all your writing projects. And, um, you know, for those who can get to readers, take Denver next year. Um, I know that they appreciate all you've done for the writing community. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And I hope we will see you and um, some of the members there. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.